If you've ever stood in front of a Viking ship replica and wondered how on earth wood that fragile could survive centuries of brutal North Atlantic weather, salt spray, insects and rot, you're asking the right question. Wood should not last that long. And yet, Viking ships, buildings, tools and everyday objects have survived not by accident, but by design. The Norse didn't rely on luck or magic. They understood wood on a level most modern people never reach, and they treated it as a living material that needed to be prepared, protected, and respected long before it ever became a ship plank or a roof beam. What you're about to learn isn't trivia. These methods worked, they were repeatable, and they're still usable today by anyone serious about long-term durability, survival, or historical accuracy. This matters for preppers and historians alike, because the Vikings were operating in a resource-scarce environment. Timber was precious in much of Scandinavia. You didn't waste it. If something was built, it was meant to last generations. Let's get into how they actually pulled that off. The Vikings began by choosing the right tree at the right moment. Viking wood preservation started long before an axe touched bark. They selected trees based on species, growth pattern, and age. Oak was preferred for ships and load-bearing structures because of its density and natural resistance to rot. Pine and spruce were used where flexibility and resin content mattered more than sheer strength. Crucially, trees were often cut in winter when sap levels were lowest. Less sap meant less moisture trapped inside the wood, which immediately reduced rot and insect attraction. They also paid attention to how a tree grew. Slow-grown trees from colder, harsher environments produced tighter growth rings. Tighter rings meant denser wood, and denser wood lasts longer. This wasn't guesswork. Generations of observation taught them which forests produced timber that survived storms, sea voyages, and decades of use. If you're applying this today, the lesson is simple. Don't harvest wood when it's wet with sap, and, well, don't assume all trees of the same species are equal. Slow growth equals durability. One of the most overlooked Viking techniques was splitting wood along the grain rather than sawing across it. When you split wood, you follow the natural fibres but when you saw it, you sever them. Viking ship planks were often cleft from logs using wedges, producing boards that retained continuous grain structure. This made them stronger, more flexible, and, honestly, far more resistant to water intrusion. This mattered at sea. A plank with intact grain swells evenly when wet and shrinks evenly when dry, reducing cracks. Cracks are where rot begins. By avoiding them in the first place, Vikings extended the life of their wood dramatically. Modern application is, well, pretty straightforward. If you're building anything meant to last outdoors, split lumber when possible, or select boards with straight, uninterrupted grain. Strength isn't just thickness, you know. It's fibre continuity. Charred wood appears across Viking archaeology, especially in posts, beams and ship components. This wasn't just accidental fire damage. Light surface charring actually carbonized the outer layer of wood, making it resistant to insects, fungi, and moisture. Carbonized wood does not rot easily. It also repels boring insects. This technique is now known as Shosugiban in Japan, 
but the Norse were doing their own version centuries earlier. Fence posts were often charred before being driven into the ground. Ship parts exposed to constant spray benefited from the same treatment. To apply this today, you just lightly torch the surface of wooden posts or boards meant for ground contact or wet environments. Then you brush off any loose char and seal it all with oil. You're actually creating a sacrificial protective layer that dramatically slows decay. Perhaps the most important preservation method was, you know, the use of pine tar. Vikings produced tar by slowly heating pine roots and resin-rich wood in these low-oxygen pits. The resulting tar was thick, sticky and, well, waterproof. Ships were coated with it regularly. Roof shingles were soaked in it. Tools were treated with it too. Tar penetrated the wood, displaced moisture and created an environment hostile to fungi and bacteria. Unlike modern finishes, it didn't trap moisture inside. It actually allowed the wood to breathe while staying protected. For practical use today, pine tar or even boiled linseed oil serves a similar function. Warm the oil or tar, apply it generously and allow it to soak in deeply. Reapply periodically. This is maintenance, not a one-time fix, and the Vikings understood that longevity requires care. Viking buildings were designed to keep wood dry through structure, not chemicals alone. Raised floors, stone foundations, steep roofs and overhangs kept water away from wooden elements. Ships were stored upside down or under cover when not in use. Airflow was critical. Trapped moisture kills wood faster than rain ever will. This principle is timeless. No preservation method works if water is allowed to sit. Proper drainage and ventilation are as important now as they were a thousand years ago. Nothing the Vikings built was meant to be ignored. Ships were retarred, beams were inspected, damaged wood was replaced early, not after failure. This mindset is the final lesson. Longevity comes from intervention before collapse. For preppers, this means, well, checking structures regularly. For historians, it explains why Viking artefacts survived at all. They weren't abandoned. They were cared for. The Vikings preserved wood for centuries without chemicals, pressure treatment or industrial tools. They did it through understanding material behaviour, environmental conditions and honestly long-term planning. In a world increasingly dependent on fragile supply chains, these methods offer real resilience. If you build with wood, store tools, or plan for long-term sustainability, Viking practices aren't just interesting, they're practical. If you found value in this deep dive into real historical methods that actually worked, subscribe to The Prepper Historian, share this with someone who takes durability seriously, and, well, keep history alive by using it.